So uh, how's everybody been, by the way? Thumbs up for a, a decent couple of weeks off. We are going to talk about Scrivener today. Now look, there's, there's a zillion and one different tools that people use to do writing. Um, I'll tell you why I came to Scrivener so that you can kind of decide if, if it's a good one for you to look at. Uh, I wanted something that was cross-platform. So my editor works on Windows. So I, I, I wanted to be able to just send a file over. Um, so it was necessary for it to be cross-platform. I also wanted it to run on both my Mac and my iPad. And Scrivener is one of the very few that, that meets that criteria. So that narrowed me down a bunch. Um, I do not like Word. I don't like Word a lot, actually. Uh, it, it's, it's way too much. There's way too much going on. It tries to be so many things to so many different people that I just, I just can't. And I've, I've written it for so many years. And, you know, especially like when you're on an iPad, there's no keystroke to change the, um, the style, like heading or body text or whatever. And so you're constantly touching or mousing. And I just, I just can't. Um, it also, frankly, isn't really well suited to writing novels. Uh, it's a word processor, but it, it lacks some of the specialization that more, more dedicated applications have. There's a few others. Um, there's one called Ulysses that I looked at real hard. Um, just didn't care for how it worked, I guess. Um, I wanted something that, that was really gonna make it easy for me to produce a nice looking paperback and a decent looking ebook. Now, something you kind of have to embrace about ebooks is that you as the author or, or publisher or whoever have very little control. Uh, you can suggest a font, but the reader will typically override it. Um, Kindles, for example, have a, a font called Bookerly that Amazon commissioned that's a really great font for reading. And they tend to override whatever font is in the book in favor of Bookerly, which I appreciate as a reader. Uh, you really, you know, it's, it's paragraphs, uh, a heading, you can insert images, italics, boldface, that's about it. You don't get a bunch. So I wanted something that could produce a really good ebook. Um, I knew I wanted to be able to produce both EPUB and Kindle, although just this past week, Amazon has announced they will no longer be accepting um, pretty much anything but EPUB. So if you're using um, Kindle Direct Publishing, they really want an EPUB as your source document. They have another format they use called KPF, Kindle Production Format or something like that, but I don't even know how to produce one of those. Uh, and they will take an EPUB and it turns out great. If you upload a Mobi, which was their old format, uh, it will actually produce a fixed flow book, meaning it won't reflow as, as well when people change font sizes and stuff like that. So pretty much EPUB or bust these days. Uh, Scrivener does all of it. Can produce a beautiful PDF for you that you can take straight to Ingram Spark or KDP for uh, paperback. KDP does hardbacks now, that's in cover uh, in beta. Um, Ingram can do paperbacks and hardbacks. There's a company called Draft to Digital that can do those, the PDF works great with those. Uh, the only thing I've noticed is that Scrivener produces a version three EPUB, which is the latest version. And so normally you'd be like, great. Certain online publishing tools will take the EPUB three, but they prefer an EPUB two. And they'll actually do more for you if you have an EPUB two, like they'll produce an index and a table of contents. Um, I've not been able to get Scrivener to do that, but there's a free tool out there that you can use to convert from pretty much any format to any other format. And that's called Caliber, C-A-L-I-B-R-E. Uh, and that's a great tool to have if you're playing with eBooks. So with all that said, um, I picked Scrivener. I'm gonna show you how I use Scrivener. There is no one right way to do it, uh, which is one of the reasons it has a relatively high learning curve. After you get into it, you may find a different way works for you. That's fantastic. But I'm gonna show you some of the things I use about it. This is not gonna be comprehensive because there's a hundred zillion things in this tool. So I'm gonna stop my video to conserve bandwidth a little bit and then see if I can share off. Okay, so this is my Scrivener. Um, I chose to show you guys the the Adherence of the Axis Omnibus Edition. So this contains three novels, Daniel Scratch, Master of the Tower, and The Fifth Axis. Now, this is great for fiction, it's great for technical books, it's great for whatever, it's just a writing tool. The reason I wanted to show you an omnibus is because it's one of the most complex structures, right? I've got three books within a book. And so that, you, you should get to see like the, the full glory of this tool in action. 
your structure happens over here on the side in this side view. Uh, and you can hide that thing. And if you ever do happen to hide it, it's called the binder. Um, and I never hide it. This is like critical to, to my life and thinking. I have broken each of the original three books into a folder. You're just doing one book. So these are gonna appear as parts. So it'll be like part one, Daniel Scratch, part two, Master of the Tower. If you're just doing one, you can eliminate this outer folder. But if I expand one, you can see what a single book lo looks like. Each chapter is a folder. This actually gets really important for something I'm gonna show you in just a second. Within a chapter, you have scenes. So if you're used to reading a fiction book, you'll notice when, when people flip between scenes, there'll be a scene breaker, either a, a straight line or maybe three asterisks, or they'll have a little fancy graphic or whatever. Um, and, and so it, it kind of represents either a shift in point of view or maybe a, a, a gap in time or something like that. But I'll show you what these look like in just a second. Um, one thing I've noticed that you had to be a little tricky bit. So this is a scene. You can now see the text. I've clicked on this document so you can see all the text. Uh, if you hit enter, so on a Mac, I'm used to being able to hit enter to rename. If you hit enter over here, it starts a new scene right there. So I'm going to delete that. Uh, just be aware of that. It took me a, a few minutes to, to get used to that. One of the cool things that Scrivener does on a computer is if I click the containing folder and I go up to view and I tell it I want to view Scrivenings, this is going to show me everything in that folder. And as I scroll down a little bit, I'm gonna find my scene break and it's right there with all the dashed lines. So I'll use this after I write a scene to go back and reread the whole chapter, all is one to make sure it's all fitting together, all seems like it's flowing well, and I don't have to switch between files. It's, it's doing it all in one view. You can do the entire book in Scrivening's mode if you want to, um, which gets to be really big. It will not do this on iOS because of the memory requirement, because there's so much memory required for all this text. When I'm in an individual scene, over here on the right-hand side, you'll notice I've got another little pane, I've got a synopsis, and I've got notes. So I didn't figure this out. You can see, see the little icon on the chapter here has a, it's actually like a little index card. And that's telling me that I've got a synopsis on that folder. And this is how I realized I could view my outline at the same time I was writing. So when you break this down, it may have been later that I figured it out. I could do it for, yeah. So on an individual scene over here in the synopsis, I've pasted in what I need to happen in this scene. And so it sits right here with me as I'm writing. And I'll even sometimes go through and, you know, put a little uh, a bullet next to it to indicate I got that bit, or I'll make some, I'll almost make it to a bullet list. This, if I had this in front of me, I know what I'm writing. And so I can get it all done nice and easy. There's another cool thing that this does though. If you've taken that approach, if you have pasted like, here's what needs to happen in this scene, in this over synopsis for the card, and you click on the folder, Instead of viewing the Scrivenings, so this, this all-in-one continual scroll, I go up to view and I'm going to hit corkboard. This is going to show me all of my scenes as index cards with their synopses, and I can edit all of that right here. This is literally how I start a chapter. I'll create a brand new folder. I'll create the first scene. I'll paste in its synopsis. I'll create another scene. Oh, you know what? that scene really should be broken into two. No problem, that's easy to do here. I can reorder them here and everything else. This is a great way to kind of organize. You can do it at the chapter level too. So if I click on the folder that represents the whole book, all the chapters that have a synopsis appear here as cards. And I can see with a card stack that they've got multiple little scenes underneath them. This is a fantastic way to take an outline that's in a, a note or just in a Word doc or a single document and start breaking it out into chapters. And then once you've got the chapters, you can start breaking it out into your individual scenes. Um, I think this is just a, a wonderful way to coordinate things. You can do so much with this. Um, this book is written entirely from the protagonist's point of view. Depending on what you're doing, you may have different point of views and you may wanna keep track of where those occur on a timeline. You can assign 
a, a label, just a colored label to all these things. And once you've done so, so like red might be one person's point of view and yellow might be another's. Another one of your view options is um, timeline mode. And I don't have the labels on, so it's not gonna work, but it'll actually stack out all these cards for you along a timeline. So you can see visually a chronology of how your, your points of view flip back and forth. And I, I just think it's spectacularly useful uh, to do that in some books. Now I wanna show you, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip ahead a whole bunch. So this is how I start organizing. I'm gonna go to the file menu and hit compile. This is where you turn your manuscript into an actual book. So you can see here, I'm compiling for EPUB. The other one I will often do is PDF, of course, but it, it compiles to a whole, whole bunch of different formats if you wanted to. So I'm gonna go PDF. I've set up over here on project formats on the left-hand side, I've set up a, a format called Don's format, which is a, the trim size I use for my paperbacks. Over on the right hand side, I'm telling it to compile the entire manuscript. I've said that this top level, which represents one of my original books is a part heading. This next level is a chapter heading and the next level are scenes. In the center here, it's gonna start showing me what those look like. So if I click on a part heading over here, I can scroll down, I can see this is how a part heading is going to be formatted. I can edit that. And I can start to decide exactly what this looks like. So I've got the formatting, I've got the title options. I'm gonna have it insert the part number. Um, you know, After each new page, I'm gonna have a break. I can have numbering for prefixes and suffixes and all this other types of, of stuff. You can define the separator. So I'll show you, remember I told you scene separators usually have like three asterisks or something like that. Uh, and you can see in this little preview here, I've got, a blank line, three asterisks, and another blank line. And I got to that by editing the scene type, going to separators, setting a custom separator. And then if I arrow down, so it's, it's a single line text box, but it actually accepts multiple lines. So it's a little confusing. You can see I've got a blank line, I've got my three asterisks, and then another blank line. So you can get really, really detailed. Uh, you can do things like transformations, like I want punctuation converted or replacements, like always look for these placeholders and replace them with this. And you can see here, it's got things for like figures and tables and so forth, because people use this for technical books as well. Um, I can look at the statistics in this, like what do I want it to include, um, all that stuff. The other important thing is at the bottom of this right-hand side, and I'm telling it I wanna add front matter and add back matter. So for this omnibus edition, I actually told it I don't want any front matter. And I want it to get the back matter from the back matter folder. These change with each format you pick. So you can have different front matter or back matter for a PDF, for an EPUB, or for anything else. So over in the binder, if I scroll down a bit, you can see my back matter folder. I've got, a, a, I, I beg people to do a review. I provide my little pronunciation guide. I have some credits. I have other things I've written, that all appears in the back matter. And under front matter, I, I for most of my books, and I'll actually show you a different one here. Let's just pull up a single book. Uh, this is the one I just finished. So the front matter here has a different one for paperback and for ebook. And for the ebook, it's really just the, the cover page. And when it produces the ebook, it will make this graphic into the cover. For the paperback though, I have to have a title page and a copyright page. You don't do that in an ebook typically. So if you look at the compile on this, so it's set here for EPUB and you can see at the bottom, it's pulling the ebook front matter. But if I change it to PDF, now it's pulling the paperback front matter and they both share the same back matter. So that's why this structure becomes important is because when you, when you actually want to, oops, said it paused my sharing. Here, let me try starting the sharing over again. Oh, I know why, it's because I flipped tabs. So you probably didn't see all that. So over here, again, I've got two different sections of front matter, paperback and ebook. And if I do a file compile, 
to the ebook, the front matter is pulling from the ebook folder. And if I shift it to compile a PDF, now the front matter is coming from the paperback folder. So that's why this structure over here gets to be really, really important. Um, this structure really determines what the end book looks like. It builds a clickable or tappable table of contents for EPUBs. And these chapter folders are what tell it what a chapter is. And you can make this as, as deeply embedded as you want to. You can go completely flat. Like you don't even have to have a table of contents. You don't have to have chapters. You can just have one long bit of text if you want to. Um, so it's, it's really, really flexible. But getting that structure set up and getting that compile set up is, is a key to really beginning. So I'm going to pause there for a second and, and see if anyone has any questions they want to ask. Just jump in. OK. For the rest of this, it's pretty much your basic word processor. There's a couple of, of neat tools it has. Uh, for example, on the edit menu, you have some writing tools, including a name generator to help generate uh, 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 names for your characters. If you hover over here, over in the status bar, you can see that my book is 56,202 words of the 60,000 word goal that I set. And in today's session, I've written zero of the 2,500 word goal that I set for myself. And you can do all that from the project menu. Um, you can show project targets and they'll pop up and they'll show you how many words and you can type in whatever you want for your total book in each session. It's a nice way to keep yourself motivated, keep, kind of keep track of where you are in your goals. Um, I believe I have this set. Let me see, I'm gonna come up here and just type something. You notice when I typed, it moved where I was typing to the center of the screen. That's called typewriter writing mode, and I really like it. Uh, it. It helps keep where I'm writing in the center. And so I've got a little bit of text above it and a bunch of space or text below it. I don't like to be writing at the bottom of the screen for some reason. Um, so you've got a bunch of ways to tweak that. There's another view it has. Now, I don't use this, so it might take me a second to find it. You can have a uh, paragraph focus mode. So see, it's graying out the paragraphs that I'm not currently on. Um, that actually freaks me out a good bit. Now I need to turn it off. Text editing, turn off focus. It has a mode called distraction free writing where it gets rid of literally everything and tries to suppress as many of your system notifications as it can. And you're just focused on your text. Um, a lot like any word processor, you can define styles. So if you have a particular heading style you want to use, um, for example, in these books, because uh, here, because I have these rune graphics, I defined a style called image. And it puts a little bit of space above and below the image. It centers the image. And this highlighting won't be seen. This yellow highlighting won't be seen in the final book. It's just there to help catch my eye as I go through. So I can, I can make sure it's formatted correctly. So there's tons and tons and tons of different, you know, options you have for setting all those things up. And it's, it's just, it's incredibly flexible. Um, I'm going to collapse all the folders over here in the binder for a second. So you can see that my manuscript, my back matter, and my front matter are technically separate folders. When I compile, I'm compiling the manuscript. And then it is adding something from the back matter and the front matter. These are not technically part of the manuscript. And, uh, and that lets them get different page numbering. So it knows that front matter gets a lowercase Roman numeral page numbering, whereas your main, the body of your work, gets uh, Arabic, you know, normal digit numbering. But then I have this notes folder. And this is literally where I put all my notes. I've got my cover copy. I've got the, the outline blocking, which is something we talked about in the last workshop session. Um, I've got the blocking for the next two books kind of started to work out. I have all my character names and a little bit of detail about them. But I want to show you something. So I'm going to stop sharing real quick. There is a feature of, of this product that I don't use that I want to make sure you see. I'm going to start a new project. And I'm just going to pick a novel so I can quickly get to something. I 
And okay, now that that's started, let me share that window. This is what a new one looks like. So you kind of get a little about this template to start with. It starts you off with a manuscript, a chapter folder, and a scene. It starts with this characters folder and the places folder. That's got front matter and back matter too. Actually, I think this one just says front matter. Yeah, fun. If you're doing some research, you've got a place to put this, but I, I want to show you what this characters bit is for. If I right click this and hit add new from template character sketch. It's got a little template and you can customize these templates, by the way, they're down here under template sheets. So whatever you care about with a character, you can actually have a page for each of your characters and have, you know, what they do, a description, their personality. I found I was more comfortable having all this information less structured and a single doc, but a lot of writers I know really use this. And you can do the same thing with places, add new from template, a setting sketch, the name of the setting, unique features, a description, sight, sound, smell, all that stuff really helps you be consistent. Um, I have found that, you know, I'll get halfway in and I'll refer to a character's hair color for the first time. And I immediately have to remember to go to the character sheet and make sure I put that so that if I refer to it in a future book or even later in this book, I'm being consistent and I'm getting it right. Uh, I'll show you another thing I did because I have a, so I have to stop sharing again. No, I can just do a new share. Okay, let's open Endless Sky. So new share, that tab. Because this is a, a meant to be a role-playing game, the characters all have character sheets. And so I have a file in my notes with the character sheet. And every single time he levels up in a skill or gains an ability or gets hurt and loses hit points or whatever, I have to come update this, right? Normally the computer would keep track of that, but I have to keep track of it. And so that's one of the things I use this notes folder for. I tend to just chuck everything into this notes folder. I don't really use, like you can see here, I didn't delete the characters folder from the binder, but there's nothing in it. There's nothing in places. I kind of put it all in here. So it's however you want to work. Um, you can do lots of stuff. So I'm going to stop there, turn the video back on, and I want everyone to just, like if you were thinking, okay, I'm, I'm going to sit down and write a book mechanically, how do I manipulate this thing? What do you feel you might want to know that I haven't touched on? Because those are the big things that are really Scrivener specific, but there's obviously a lot more that's in the actual, just, you know, typing words that, that you might want to know. And we can go around the room if you want to. Think about it for a sec and I'll tell you one thing. Scrivener files are actually a zip file. Um, in fact, no, I don't want to. If I break one open, it breaks it. Um, it is just a zip file. It has a .scriv file name extension, but it, it really is a zip file at the end of the day. So you can hack it open and get to all those files. It has a trash. That is the one thing I will recommend. It, it has its own internal trash. Uh, you're going to want to empty that out from time to time because it will it will get honking big, even though it's just text, because it keeps everything you've ever deleted. So any real quick questions, because the next thing I want to talk about is the editing process, um, how I collaborate with my editor. Okay, then let's reshare. Scrivener takes a different approach to track changes than something like Word. What you do is up on the format menu, and can, can somebody tell me if you can see this menu? I, because it's a Mac, the menu bar is not technically part of the share, so I'm not sure if you can see the menu. Yes, we can. You can see it. Okay, good. So I come down here to revision mode, and you put whatever revision mode you were in. So my my editor always goes for first revision. And if we're going back and forth, then on the next run, she might put it in second revision. So it will highlight any changes that are made in that color. So I'll turn this on right now. Enter revision mode. So now as I'm typing, it's showing up in red. As the author, when I get this file back, I can then quickly go through and see all of those revisions. And once I'm happy with them, 
in each document, or if I'm in Scrivening's mode, like if I'm looking at the doom scroll of all my chapters, I can do this all at once. I can go back up to format, revision mode, remove current revision color, or remove all revisions. That doesn't take them out, it makes them permanent. So it's, it's kind of like accept, and you can do it on a case by case basis too. So I could choose, I, I rarely do, honestly, but if I put in revision mode, so we are, we are still in first revision mode. So if I do something like this, I can come along later and I can accept that revision or deny it or get rid of it or whatever I wanna do. But this is more about showing you the final state. Like if I were to delete something, even though I'm in revision mode, that's, that's gone now, right? So it, it works a little bit differently. It's meant to show you the final state and then you can run through the revisions one at a time. So we'll get rid of both those things. The other feature this has, uh, and it's over here on the right-hand side, there's a comment pane. So I can highlight something and I can make a new comment about it. And then that stays highlighted that way until someone else comes through here later and deletes the comment. So that's equivalent to words comment feature. And my editor will use that a lot to query a particular phrase or a sentence or something else. Uh, the other big thing I find that people really miss out on is snapshots. Snapshots are a per file thing. You're not snapshotting the entire project. So it's literally making a copy. If you start taking big snapshots of the entire project, uh, it's going to balloon the file out quite a bit, which is fine if that's what you want to do. But I can take a snapshot of this file and it makes a cute little snapshot. Snap Shoy. I can go make some changes. I'll take another one. Now I can compare these two. And it will let me go through and see what's different in both of them. I can go back to the original. I can, uh, I can roll back this snapshot. Yes, I want to roll it back. That actually makes a new snapshot. So I can roll back to this one. And now you see that I rolled back to the pre-edit one. That edit is actually gone. So if you're about to make a bunch of changes to something, that's a great way to snapshot the file. So you can always get back to a particular spot. I use that on my character sheet a lot. That way I can always kind of roll back to a previous state of that and I'll know exactly where I am. Um, so that's a really cool feature. You can add tags on a particular file help you. Um, I've done that before where I've introduced a new concept um, and I can put bookmarks in. So if I need to quickly, if there's a section that I'm constantly going back to for reference, I can put a, a bookmark and these are document wide. So I can quickly get back to that part uh, and, and refer to whatever it is I was referring to. So this little right hand pane over here has a bunch of important stuff on it that's uh, uh, really useful to know about. All right, so I'll pause again. And I'd, I'd love to get some questions from folks. Uh, you use both the Mac version and Windows version, or you just use Mac only? I've only used the Windows version. I'm also allergic to Windows these uh, Windows. I, I, I'm just, I'm pure Mac. That's they good. do look remarkably alike, aside from, some, aside from some changes to like the way the icons are drawn, they look a lot alike. Yeah, you know, sometimes editing files between systems, there's subtle differences. If they're keeping it all, yeah, hopefully they're not. He, um, yeah, so the, the guy who wrote this actually is an author and he wrote Scrivener because he couldn't find anything he liked. Um, and he happened to be a software developer, so he knew how. And there was a lot of disparity between Windows and Mac until Scrivener 3.0, and they pretty much got it to parity. And he really never adopted any of the Mac UI conventions. So it also doesn't adopt any of the Windows UI conventions. It's kind of its own thing. Uh, but that means it looks the same pretty much wherever, you, even on iOS, it looks pretty much, it's dumbed down on iOS. It does less, uh, but it's, it's pretty much the same for basic writing. If you're using it on iOS or the- It's also really- 
if you're using on iOS or the files like in the cloud where you can edit them or you got like a OneDrive or something? Yeah, so <laughs> the one thing I don't like about Scrivener is the way they do sync. And I know why they do it that way. They do it to maintain more cross compatibility. He supports Dropbox. I've never used it because I've never read anything but people who've had problems with it corrupting their files. So what I will usually do is on, on my iPad, I'll go into the files app I'll, because that's where all of my documents live. I'll go to my documents folder, I'll open up the file that creates a copy of it on the iPad. When I'm done, I have to move that from the iPad back to my documents folder, which lives in iCloud. Similar situation for Windows. Um, you can use Dropbox for cross device syncing, but there's like a whole process. It keeps track if the file is open. So you have to basically tell it to, to prepare the file for mobile syncing, and that will close the file and tell it that it's okay. And then you can open it on another device. And I, I don't love that pattern. Um, I, I wish you did it a little bit differently, but it doesn't. And it's, I don't know if anybody's looked, um, the name of the, the company is Literature and Latte and Scrivener is like a, a $50 application. Like it, it's not this $180, you know, Microsoft Word style license, it's, it's pretty cheap. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll look on the Mac app store real quick and tell you. Yeah, it's it's forty nine bucks. Did you ever look at ASCII doc or ASCII doc FX when you were looking at Scrivener? I never looked at ASCII doc. Um, I I really wanted the PDF formatting feature and the ability to designate parts and chapters and scenes, and it doesn't do that. Um, when I was writing for LeanPub. When I was publishing primarily through LeanPub, they want Markdown, full stop. So any text editor, obviously a Markdown specific editor is more helpful because it'll it'll show you the formatting you're doing. Um, I used an app called Byword because again, it runs on Mac and iOS. And that's the big reason I picked it. Um, most Markdown editors, my experience are ab about the same. Like they're within a rounding error of each other. So like whichever one you use is cool. Um, LeanPub does an excellent job of turning Markdown into a nice looking PDF, but I wanted a lot more control over front matter and back matter. Uh, I wanted to be able to put in, you know, my images in a really specific way. And they're really geared around technology books more so than novels. Um, I, I, I have a hard time pushing anyone away from LeanPub because I've enjoyed working with it so much. Uh, but moving forward, I'm, I'm writing pretty much exclusively in Scrivener. I think I'm noticing Chrissy Lemaire has been on Twitch doing her learn DBA tools in a month of lunches. She's been using ASCII.com. Yep. Yeah, and and that's another case. Like when we, we've got a session coming up where we're gonna talk about the business of publishing and everything I'm talking about is self-published, right? So I can make all my own decisions. I, it, it's up to me to get it in the right format for wherever I'm gonna publish it. Um, for example, I just went what they call wide. I went into wide distribution for my book, Shell of an Idea, which means it's no longer on Kindle Unlimited, but that means it's no longer exclusive to Amazon. So I have um, a company called Ingram Spark. Ingram is one of the largest book distributors in the universe, and they have a self publishing portal called Ingram Spark. So I had to reformat the book a bit to get it in Ingram Spark for paperback distribution. I use another company called Draft to Digital for my ebook wide distribution because they'll get it into Apple and Kobo and Barnes and Noble and a bunch of places I've never even heard of. And I had to, you know, massage my EPUB to what they were going to be happy with, which it turns out they were they were pretty much fine with the EPUB that Lean Pub had made. Um, so that's all on me. Chrissy, on the other hand, is working with a publisher, Manning Books. Um, and I work with them for my soft skills book. They're reasonably flexible in a way that most publishers aren't. So for me, I'm writing in Google Docs um, because it was the, the lowest impact ver option that they had to offer me. 
I don't want Word, which is what they would normally stick you into. Um, but they're actually okay with ASCII docs. So they, they have a way of taking that and, and turning into to what they need. Um, so when you're with a publisher, you're going to be stuck with whatever the publisher wants. Um, and a lot of publishers out there, especially in the tech world, are still, they're like still full on Microsoft Word or, or open office that can output a word. Like, oh, you don't have to use Word, except you really do. Um, so yeah, if you're with a publisher, it's, it's a whole different, whole different ballgame. Who else? Jump in, ask some questions. Remember, this is no fun if it's just me talking, especially on a Saturday. Okay. I mean, the reason I, I decided to do this class was writing technical stuff for work myself, but then my wife has written like a half dozen romance novels, and I may try and help her self-publish them. She wrote them in Word, we use Caliber, turn um, them into movies. Scrivener is so much easier for me to be productive in than Word ever was. I'm you know part of it with Word, part of it with Word is you have to make this decision of, am I gonna like make each chapter a separate file, which means I can never look at them all at once, or am I gonna thunk it all into one gigantic Word doc, which is this massively risky proposition and you know at a certain point it it gets it starts to slow down depending on your computer because the memory requirement scrivener doesn't force you to make that choice and that's why i i really like that i can see everything all at once but they live in separate files so i can focus on just what i want without having a you know a scroll bar that's so big that the the puck is this tiny little single pixel thing um so yeah i I've, i really really enjoyed working in scrivener I, the fact that it puts out such a a beautiful PDF with relatively little effort is important to me. Um, and then the fact that I don't have to try it at all to turn into a good EPUB, like it just, it does it and boom, no work and you've got a great looking EPUB uh, is, is super, super helpful. Okay, so if there's no more questions, I'm gonna make everyone go. So we'll give, we'll give you a couple more minutes to, to say something. Um, and if nothing else, you can jump in and let me know how your past couple of weeks were and, and, and what you've been thinking of the series. Actually, yeah, just one comment I had was the, uh, uh, it, it sounds, uh, it sounds kind of silly, but I think, uh, anytime I write like a, uh, it's like sort of a blog post or technical documentation, I got into the habit of, I just jump in and start writing. But I said, I was looking, I, I had one thing, one thing I was writing on. And I said, well, it's probably four or five different scenarios. So I think it was stuck in the back of my mind that I needed an outline or you stuck in the back of my mind. So I said, let me just jot those down. I looked, I said, hey, I just wrote an outline. I didn't even know it. <laughs> and then as yeah. I started writing under the first scenario, I said, oh, this is making this easier. <laughs> it does. Yeah, it really does. It makes for a better product at the end of the day, too. Uh, if you're ever going to work with a publisher, the worst part of the process for me is the development edit, where they kind of go through and look at, does this seem like it's in the right order and all that stuff? And if you don't start with an outline, that that part of the process is just horrific. It's it's brutal. Yeah, I don't, uh, and, and there's no, uh, I'm not going right, to so, write anything without some sort of an outline. There you go. That's it. So our next session is going to be on the business of writing. Um, I'm going to talk about working with a publisher, um, how you pitch to a publisher, how you get in the door, uh, what the financial terms look like, all of that. Uh, then I'm also going to talk about self-publishing. Obviously, it's a lot easier to get in the door because yeah, you're the only one in your way. But I'll talk about the process and what it looks like and some of the decisions you have to make, uh, what the finances typically can turn out to be um, and all of that. So do me a favor, because we're meeting again next week, right? We don't have a gap this time. Yeah. So spend the week and jot down some questions you have about, about the writing business. And it doesn't just have to be books. It can be magazine articles. 
It can be writing articles for websites like Tech Target that you know produce all this short form content. Um, that's a business too, and and I've done all that, and we can talk about all that if it's of interest. Um, so so make that your mission for the week. Um, give Scrivener a look. Uh, it's unfortunate that a lot of these apps these days, because they're so cheap, they don't come with trials. But you know, at least they're cheap. Um, I would really recommend finding a good a good publishing tool. Um, for example, if you were to tell me, hey, you know, my, my main thing is I'm just blogging in WordPress and, and I don't love WordPress's web editor. I wanna be able to kind of work offline in a little bit less of a distracted mode. Um, that's one of the reasons I discovered ByWord because if you pay for their, like it, it was a free app and if you pay for the $5 upgrade, it can publish to a WordPress blog because WordPress accepts Markdown. Um, so I, I, once I discovered that, I was like, oh my God, this is fantastic. I, I would have 10 or 12 docs open at all the, all the time and I'd work on them a bit. When I was done with one, I can publish directly from ByWord to my blog. So like, think about what you're, think about what, what holds you back mechanically. Like if it's, you know, every time I open Word, I feel like I'm spending 20 minutes setting up the right template. Okay, well, don't use that. Let's find you a different tool. Um, look for what gets in the way right? It's supposed to be your brain feeding directly to the page. Anything else is in the way. So if something's in the way, think about looking at a better tool. Yeah, I have to agree with that in the WordPress. Kind of why I wanted to do this was to produce more blog content. And WordPress, you know, the learning curve for WordPress, you know, setting up blogs, God. setting up columns, setting up, you know, you want to add a picture and it's a 45 minute idea, you know, how do I do that? And then you know, so that's kind of the the guts of that. What it, that's what it is, and kind of trying to remove those barriers. So. Yeah, I loved Byword for that. I really did. Now, all it's going to produce is a straight-on article. Like, it's not going to do a lot of fancy design elements and stuff like that. But once it does that, you can then go in and play with the design if you want to. The the block editor on on WordPress. Oh man. I, I, I still, I still struggle a little bit. Like it's, it's a lot, it's a lot to deal with. Um, I appreciate why they did it, but it's like, in order to cater to people who want a really beautiful page, you have stepped on the people who just want to spew some text into a web page, right? Um, so it, it, that's one of the things that really pushed me to buy a word. And there's other apps like that. Like if you, I don't know if you're Mac or Windows, if you're Mac, you can jump in their app store and, and punch in, you know, WordPress writing or WordPress publisher, or WordPress offer. Those are good search terms on a search engine too, um, to find apps that have been designed to solve that problem because you're not the only one that has that problem like me. And it's, you I, know, think, it's, I think you can even get plugins that give you back the classic editor. Yeah, and I, at work, we use Confluence and, and that's kind of the blockiness. They, they use a lot of blockiness. So when you want to do a table or whatever, that's kind of where I have a small understanding of kind of what WordPress is trying to do or is what they do. Um, but it's, I just want to write and it's kind of kludgy to be able to figure it out when you just want to spew things on the paper. So. What was the old. Uh, yeah. It, it's a little known fact that. Oh, good. What the old uh, Microsoft product. It was an open writer. A live writer. Oh, uh, live, live writer. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It's that available again through a login uh, tool. Yeah. Yeah. And it will publish to WordPress. Yeah. So it, it, it won't anymore. Um, WordPress updated their publishing APIs a couple of versions back. And depending on what you're doing, sometimes LiveWriter will break it now because LiveWriter is like a, a deprecated product, right? They don't update it anymore. Um, but there's lots of stuff like I used the heck out of LiveWriter back when, when I could still stand Windows. Um, WordPress so there's, has their there's own. There's a lot of other tools that are like that. Yeah, WordPress has their own standalone editor for Windows. Um, I want to say it might be a Windows Store app. Um, I think I think it is. Yeah. And and they have something similar for iOS. And and frankly, um, like Zach, I don't know if you have an iPad, but I do. the the iOS WordPress app is better than the WordPress web app for just writing it's still block based but it it only supports like four blocks 
So mm -hmm. all the complexity goes away and you're just writing text and inserting images and it's fine. Yeah, I'll have to try that. Because I, I recently picked up a, a new Logitech keyboard, the MX Keys, uh, for the simple purpose that I can switch between my devices and number three is my iPad. So I don't have to, I can have a full size keyboard and still type. So. <laughs> yeah, and there's, there's another important consideration um, with, with Scrivener too. Keep in mind, one of the things it can compile to is multi-markdown, which, which WordPress can eat. And when you compile, you don't have to compile the entire book. When you go to that compile window, you've got check marks. You can decide what you're going to compile. So I do know a couple of folks who use Scrivener for blogging and they keep all their blog articles in one Scrivener file. And each chapter is a different blog article and they'll break it down in scenes sometimes because that that's invisible once it's published right and they'll just compile a book to multi-markdown and then they've got a little terminal command they run to push that into their their wordpress blog so you can do all sorts of neat things open live writer all right so somebody somebody resurrected it well good for them in the windows world um, I do know people who use VS Code to publish to their blogs um, because it's very happy to support Markdown. Um, I, I have a love-hate affair with VS Code. It feels heavy to me sometimes. Um, so I, I stick with what works for me, but that's why there's so many tools out there for different folks. Yeah, I live in VS Code for work, so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you kind of want to do something different or or use that same skill. I agree okay, with look, uh, I'll wrap us up there. I'll, I'll wrap us up there and give everyone their weekends. Uh, we'll see you next time. We're going to talk about the business of writing. Um, but until then, I hope you have a, a really wonderful, productive week. Take it easy. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.